Right, Zakir Lachem. Please, yeah. Where's Yusuf? Yusuf, some water, yeah. Whoever you are, I need water. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Look. Is someone getting it? I'm getting dry, I just need some water. And Let's get my water. All right. طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So the topic as you have all heard is the cell phone fiqh The cell phone fiqh, the fiqh of using a cell phone And I wanted to begin by saying that technology is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And as we have all learned there is a way to use the blessing in obedience of Allah azza wa jal or sometimes people use blessings in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the way we're supposed to regard any blessing is that we are thankful to Allah azza wa jal for the blessing, we thank Him. And the second thing is that we use it in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that goes for any blessing we get from Allah azza wa jal, we thank Him, we use it in the obedience of Allah. Because it's, it's shameful that Allah gives you a blessing, He gives it to you as a gift, and you use it to disobey Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so with that then, before we move past that point, how many people remember to thank Allah for having a cell phone? We always talk about the blessings that people take for granted. Yeah, People take for granted certain blessings. They thank Allah what? After they have a meal, they say Alhamdulillah. They see a blind person, they say Alhamdulillah. They see someone ill, they say Alhamdulillah for my health. But certain things we ne- rarely remember to thank Allah Azza wa Jal for because we take them for granted. Such as having good hair, for example, having good skin. Some people have you know, bad skin, irritable skin, discolored skin. Yeah? Having you know, teeth, good teeth, teeth are, that are in good condition. How many people thank Allah for their teeth? Take it for granted. Yeah, I've got teeth. So what? But it's a blessing from Allah Azza wa Jal. And only when one gives you a, a problem or breaks or you have a toothache, then you realize what a blessing it was when there were no problems. So remember to thank Allah Azza wa Jal for this blessing. Allah Azza wa Jal gave you this blessing, thank Him for it. Now, some people might argue when they hear the topic of the lecture, the cell phone fiqh, they might say, why does Islam have to have a say in everything? Now, even with cell phones, you're going to tell us makroh and halal and do this and don't do that. Why does Islam have to have a say in everything? And the answer simply is, if, 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 if Islam teaches you how to wash yourself, after using the restroom. Why wouldn't it have a say on how to use the restroom? I mean, on how to use the cell phone. Zakallah khair, So, if every little detail is discussed in Islam, why wouldn't the use of the cell phone be discussed? Why wouldn't there be guidelines for that? Because, if you look, you will see that Allah Azza wa and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they went into the rules of visitation in great detail in the Qur'an and in the Sunnah, the Ahadith. They went into the rules of visitation in very great detail. Why? Because visitation deals with a very important aspect of Islam, which is the aspect of mu'amalat, of dealings and dealing with one another, which is something very important in Islam. Because what happens when you err in the way you deal with people, you get hatred between the believers, you get jealousy, you get envy. These misunderstandings that lead to backbiting, that lead to rumors, that, that, that lead to fighting and people not speaking to each other for days. All this happens when people make mistakes in how they interact with one another. And so Allah Azza wa Jal, the Prophet Sallam, they told, they showed us the ways of how to interact with one another. And no doubt the cell phone is one of the means by which we interact with one another. So no doubt there have to be some guidelines on how to use or how not to use this instrument. Now I want to begin by saying also that the cell phone is it's a small electronic instrument that's linked to another small but dangerous instrument. What is the other dangerous instrument that's linked to the cell phone? The tongue. The tongue, no doubt. You know, the tongue is, is an interest, a very interesting organ. It's very small and it's a muscle, but it doesn't get tired. True or false? Muscle never gets tired. Tongue just keeps going, going, going. You ever hear someone say, you know, I've been talking too much, my tongue hurts? No, they say my throat hurts, right? You know, sometimes your jaw, if you're, if you're eating, you know, your jaw might hurt you a lot. Your throat might hurt you from swallowing too much. But tongue doesn't get tired. So now this is a recipe for disaster. 
Because one, it's an instrument that never, never tires. Two, few people control their tongue. Few people control their tongue. And not only that, it's a, it's a dangerous instrument as indicated by many hadith. For example, Abu Huraira radiallahu an, when he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what of the things most leads people into the hellfire? And the Prophet sallallahu responded, the tongue and the sexual organs. So the tongue is one of the things that most takes people into the hellfire. Most leads people into the hellfire, the tongue. And also the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'adh bin Jabal, وَهَلْ يَكُبُّ النَّاسَ فِي النَّارِ عَلَى إِلَّا حَصَائِدُ أَلْسِنَتِهِمْ So is there anything that topples people on their faces into the hellfire other than their tongues? So he's saying that the tongue is one of the things that most takes people into the hellfire. People fall on their face into the hellfire because of their tongue, because of what they say. So the, the thing is that we, a lot of people are talking and they're talking more because they have cell phones and they're talking without much control. Just in the year 2005, which is about four or almost five years ago, there were two billion people on earth who had cell phones. Two billion people. And those of you who have gone overseas, you've seen in some, certain countries, even beggars have a cell phone. You know? They're begging you, they're like, can you spare some? Hold on a second. Okay. So, uh, they're spread and they're everywhere. So let me start by, you know, some, you know, a whimsical look at cell phones. There was a brother and he would tell us about how he had 2,000 minutes. This was the plan they gave him, 2,000 daytime minutes, not counting nights and weekends. And he said that he would expire, he would finish the whole 2,000 minutes. So they gave him another offer of 3,000 minutes. And he said, I would finish the, all 3,000 minutes. This is the daytime. We're not counting nights and weekends. But he would finish 3,000 daytime minutes. What does that mean? That is two days and two hours. Two full days of speaking. Imagine that. And if you count nights and weekends, maybe he speaks for three days and a half non-stop. Every month, speaking for three days and a half non-stop. And you know, a lot of times, the conversations are not really that important. You know, a lot of times people call you, hey, what's going on? What are you, you're eating? Huh? What are you having? Kebab? Yeah. Okay, do you have anything important to tell me, Habibi? Or are you just wasting my time? But a lot of times, it's just useless conversations. So he said he started to do something. Every time he'd finish a phone call, and most calls were like one minute, one minute and a half, two minutes. He said, when I finished the phone call, I saw how long it took. And then I would start to make dhikr of Allah for that, the same duration. So if I spoke for four days a month, then at least I made dhikr of Allah for four straight days a month. But after a while, he gave up. Why? It's too much talking. Couldn't keep up with it. So... Uh, we use this device for a, a lot of talk and rarely do people watch what they say and rarely are they aware of what are the proper ways to use the device. So the thing is people could be gathering a lot of sins from their incorrect usage of the cell phone. So that's kind of sad because you're paying money to get sins. You, know, you, you can get them for free or better at it, don't get any, right? But you're paying money and you're getting bills and you're getting sins. That's not a good thing. Type. Uh, there was actually one study that was done in, uh, in one of the Muslim lands and they found that people who have cell phones were prone to lying more. So that doesn't mean that if you have a cell phone you're a liar, you know. You can watch someone, oh, see that guy, he's a liar, he's got a cell phone. That's not what it means. What it means, I'll explain, is that they found that, uh, you know, before let's say you had an appointment with someone at 6 o'clock. So if you called his home, this is before they invented cell phones. If you called that person at home at uh, 5.45 and they answered, you know where they are, right? You don't have to ask him, where are you? You know, because you called the landline, you called his house, and he answered. But after they invented phones, people could lie easily. So you'd call someone, where are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm on the 401, and he's still in his bedroom. Yeah? Or he'll tell you, like, I'm just getting on the highway, but he's actually just getting into his car. But the highway is close to the car, and it's not that far from his house, so I'm just getting on the highway, but he's just getting into the car, you know. So, uh, so a lot of people, you know, lie because they have the phone, they can tell you they're in this place or in that place. Uh, a friend of mine was telling me, in one of the Muslim countries, he was, he was riding a bus in the middle of the city, and some guy got a call on the phone, and he starts speaking out loud, everyone can hear him. He's like, yeah, I'm at the border right now, I'm really, really far. Everybody started laughing at him, and he felt the shame. Because you, you know, you're a blatant liar here. In the middle of town, you're like, I'm at the border, at the edge of the country. And so, and there are other issues where 
uh, sometimes uh, people they buy a certain phone to kind of try to show a certain status, right? Now the, the scholars make an exception if the phone, your suit, your car, the way you dress is part of you know the business persona, let's call it, that you're trying to you know make clients feel that you're a professional, you have a professional business, so you dress well, you have a nice car, and you have a phone that's a PDA that shows you're organized. They say that's not a problem, but sometimes people just try to show off. Uh, and try to make some kind of uh, a statement using other objects or objects that they that they own. So you'll find someone who has an iPhone, which is supposedly the coolest phone, right? Yeah? So then the guy has an iPhone, but he just wants to put it out of his pocket and put it on the table uh, for no reason, just to show people, I've got the iPhone, you know? And usually this happens when someone is kind of weak, you know? they Like the people you see in the streets now who play very, very loud music, right? These people, they don't have hearing problems. They're actually doing it for you. They're making it really loud because they want to get attention. And they want people to look at them as they, as they pass by or so people could pay attention to their vehicle. Because they, they don't have anything maybe up here or enough to iman. So they feel nothing is great about them except what they have, what they own, what they possess. And this like, uh, I always give the example. One time we're, we're going to Jum'ah. So we're four brothers, four big grown men. And we're going to Jum'ah prayer. And three of us have our cars parked this way. One of us even had a, a minivan. And there was this fourth, the fourth guy, we were just introduced to him, so we don't know him very well. He insisted we go all the way to the back of the building to take his car to the masjid. You see? So four grown men were walking all the way back to the back of the building. And when we get there, his car is a two-seater Mercedes. And we're four. And then... When we get there, he does, this, uh, he does this fake thing. He's like, oh, it won't fit? What do you think? It's a two-seater, and we're four. What do you think? Three of us will cram into the front seat or something. You didn't notice? You don't have a back seat? But this poor guy, he, he felt that he had to show us who he was by showing us his vehicle. So he brought us all the way to a two-seater just to show us, look, this is my car. So we can look at him differently now. Like we'll respect him more because he had his, his two-seater Mercedes. You joking? I have a Ford Pinto, man. Are you kidding me? So, uh, so, and you know when phones first came out, those people who had cell phones when they first came out, especially in the Muslim man, these were the coolest people on earth. And even though the phones were big and ugly, these people, there were some people who were sick. They were just, every time they saw a human being, they pretended they were on the phone, closing a serious business deal. Yeah, okay, so I'll wire the 30,000 tomorrow, inshallah. Every, and there was, I mean, every time a human being passed by, they did this. Some people were sick like that, but they, the phone said, told people who they were. They didn't have anything else to show for themselves. It had to be their phone. So that's some, some of the things that people do. But I do want to say it's not all going to be just negative about the phones. We all know that you can use the phone for a lot of good. Some examples of that, you can, you know, the phone can remind you of prayer times, the alarm can wake you up for Fajr. I know a lot of times of brothers who in, in one locality, they would all call each other up for Fajr. And this person will wake that person up. They all call each other. That's a good use of the phone. Um, it can, like I said, wake you up for Fajr using the alarm itself. Or uh, you can use it for Surat Al-Arham to kind of tie the relations with the wombs, keep in contact with your family, and they can keep in contact with you. Also, you can organize your life, organize your time through the different kind of reminders and, and calendars in the phone. There's all some of the good. Of course, you can also put the Qur'an now. You can put it in audio form in the phone. And you can even put it in, in legible form, like the written Arabic on the screen for those of us who have... And the better phones, you can read through the Quran wherever you are. So all that is good, and you can also use it for da'wah. Uh, one of the one of the people that I know, a very nice brother, we don't overpraise him in the sight of Allah. He tells me his story when he started to become practicing. He said, "I was sitting one day and I got a text from a friend. Now, one, it wasn't one of those forwarded texts or what have you." He said. I opened it and it was written specifically for me. The brother said, this is all it said. It said, Ya Akhi, go to the masjid, free up some time. Go to the masjid, read Surah Al-Zumar and contemplate Surah Al-Zumar. That's all it said. He said, I took it seriously. I freed up myself, went and prayed Maghrib at the masjid, sat down and started to contemplate Surah Al-Zumar. He said, when I reached a certain verse, that was it. He started to become a practicing, yani better practicing and put effort into akhlaq and act of worship and all that. 
And that person, he said this was two years ago, that person doesn't even know that I've changed. I, I haven't met him or seen him again since then. So it can be used for da'wah and it can be used for a lot of good. So now we want to talk about some of the etiquettes of making calls and the etiquettes of receiving phone calls. The first thing I want to talk about is the hours, alright? Don't call people late at night or at times when you know that they're going to be asleep. The exception would be someone that has already let, let you know what their sleeping schedule looks like. So if someone tells you, call me anytime, I sleep at 2 a.m., then you can call him until 2 a.m., you can call him at 1.30 or any other time. Because he gave you the green light and you know their, their schedule now, their sleep pattern. But we know the Prophet ﷺ used to dislike talking after Isha prayer, right? And he also would sleep early, sometimes after Isha, and there are few people who sleep immediately after Isha prayer. So, call, only call people if you know that this is what they do. They gave you the green light to call them late at night, or they gave you the green light to call them very early in the morning. Some people call you at 7 a.m. But if they know you're awake after Fajr, yani some people after Fajr, they, they remain awake, so you can receive a call at, at 7, it's no problem. They've been awake since 5. 7 is quite late for them actually, they've been awake for 2 hours. But some families and some people, they love to get that sweet nap after Fajr. You know what I'm talking about, right? That sweet, sweet nap, right? And these people, when you call them, it's, it's very distracting. Some of them, their children are sleeping, or their parents might be asleep, and you call them at that time. Only do it if you're aware that that person doesn't mind it, or that it's okay with them. But unfortunately, a lot of people know this. Do we really need a lecture to say, don't call people late at night? We don't, but people call late at night. And they think they're smart. So they do things like they throw in a disclaimer or like a, a quick apology. They'll do things like they'll call you at 1 a.m. You answer it, I hope I'm not disturbing you. What do you think? It's 1 a.m. It, what, what do you expect? You are disturbing, but can you say that to someone? And that's why they'll ask you things that, uh, you know, uh, am I bothering you? Well... You don't ask a question where the person can never answer in the affirmative. You tell someone, am I bothering you? Even if he knows you quite well, do you think he'll say, yes, Sir Habibi, you're bothering me. It's difficult to say that. So don't ask someone a question that they couldn't answer you, especially when, you, when you, and they can't answer you in the affirmative. And I remember one time this guy came to my house and his daughter was just tearing up the house. I mean, she was just tearing things down and just putting them like this. And he's not stopping her, you know. And he's telling me about politics and stuff and I'm just looking at him and then I'm looking at her. I couldn't focus with him. So then he noticed that I was so distraught. So then he looked at her, he saw what she was doing. Finally, he noticed it. She was actually making a, a design. She really was making a design all over the house with furniture and with pieces of furniture. So then suddenly he noticed what she was doing. He looked at me and he said, it's okay. How do you answer that? He's already smiling. He's saying it's okay. Then he's nodding already. He's not even letting me answer. It's okay. What do I tell him? No. He's the guest. It's difficult. So don't ask people questions where they couldn't answer you honestly anyways. You know? Uh, like the guy who called you up. He's like, I'm sorry, were you asleep? Well, when I said, Assalamu alaikum, you should have guessed it. But then they told you, oh, okay, well, well, I need to ask you this question, so he doesn't care any, really. Just that concerned part, will you sleep? And then, well, tell me the answer to this question. So I don't really care. So that's the thing. Don't call people when it's very late at night, and don't call people when yeah, very early in the morning, unless you know, or they've given you the green light to call them at these times. Second thing, let's talk about the number of times that you can call someone. It doesn't mean how many times you let the phone ring. It means how many times can you call someone, let it go into voicemail, and then call them back again until it goes into voicemail. One guy actually called me about 38 or 34 times. For the beginning, I was in the shower, and then when I came out, I saw that he called me like 14 times in a row. Then it became a challenge between me and him. I'm like, I'm not going to pick up, and I'm going to see how long you're going to keep doing this. And he's like, I'm going to keep doing this until you pick up. So he called me about 38 different times, you know? One guy was boasting to me that he called someone 54 times in a row. He'd go into voicemail, hang up, send. Go into voicemail, hang up, send. 54 times in a row. And he's proud of this, you know. So let's make, let's make a comparison here. Someone visits your house, they come to visit you, and we're talking physically now. So physically, whatever that entails, they, take, they put on their coats, their boots, they take the bus, they, take, they, they drive their own car all the way to your house across town, they walk up the stairs, they come and knock on your doorbell, or knock on your door. So if you, if you heard the first knock, you don't answer. 
They knock again. You heard the second one. You don't answer. The third one, you don't answer. What are they supposed to do? They're supposed to go back, right? Or what if you open the door and say to them, Assalamu alaikum wa and everything, but I'm so sorry, but this is actually not a good time. What should he do or she? Leave. Should they get angry? They don't have the right to get angry. See, Allah Azza wa teaches us here who has more rights. And the person who is in their home, they have more rights. So Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, وَإِن قِيلَ لَكُمْ ارْجِعُوا فَارْجِعُوا هُوَ أَزْكَى لَكُمْ Allah Azza wa says, and if it's, said, if it's said to you to return, if it's told to you, go back or return, return, it is better for you. This is, this is, this is the rule here. When someone, if someone tells you go, and this is not a good time, you, know, you go back, you go back. Or if you knock three times and no one answers, you start to go back. And it, meaning that it's enough to believe that they heard the first knock and second and third, and no one answers, then it's time for you to turn around and go back. Then you all know the narration of Umar radiallahu anhu when the man knocked on his door three times, he didn't open. But he opened a while later. When he opened the door, the man was way over there because he was following the, the sunnah. So you don't get angry with someone. One, they were being very honest with you. You should appreciate the fact that they're that honest with you. And which means that there's some level of closeness between you. Because most people now, if you were a stranger, they'd be too embarrassed to tell you that. But the fact that they told you that, they're honest with you. The fact that they're, the, the two of you now are doing a sunnah that's a forgotten sunnah. So you don't get angry whatsoever. Allah Azza wa says, go back, it's better for you. That means it's better. So this is what's supposed to happen. So this is someone who is physically, make, I mean, physically all the way got, it, got to your house. And you have the right to not answer them, and you have the right to turn them back. What about someone who just simply hits a few buttons, and he enters into the middle of your home? Your phone is in your living room, your bedroom, it's ringing. This person, by pushing these buttons, makes this noise in the middle of your house, not just at your door. He might be with his family, with his children, and now you're disturbing him in the middle of his home. If he decides to not pick up, it's totally up to them. You didn't even go through the, the effort of changing and driving over to their house. If you went through the effort, you don't have the right to get angry. Let alone if you just put, push a few buttons. If they don't answer, that's their right. You don't have the right to get angry. And you can make excuses for people. Maybe the person was sick and it happened. Maybe he's in the restroom. Maybe he forgot the phone in his car. Anyone here forget your phone in the car? It happens so many times. You leave your phone in the car, you go upstairs. If someone calls you, you come back, you find like five, six missed calls. It's possible. So maybe he left the phone in, in his car, or maybe his battery died, and he left the charger at work, so he won't have it for another 12 hours, or what have you. It's all possible. Maybe he lost the phone. Seek excuses for people. But most people, they, they, they don't seek excuses for you, and they start to get upset. So you find if you lose your phone, or you leave it in your car, and you come back, you find like four or five messages from the same person. And you listen to the voicemail message, and every time you see the message, you keep getting angrier and angrier. First message, Salaam alaikum, hey, Kim Halak, it's me, Ali, give me a call. Okay. Second message, hey, it's me, Ali, give me a call, I called you, man, you give me a call back. Third message, yeah, I've been calling you for the last three minutes, you still haven't answered my call. Type, wait a little bit, leave one voicemail and state your, your message, and that's it. But people just keep getting angry and angry and then they accuse you, maybe you hate them, maybe this and that, maybe you ignore them. But actually, maybe I did ignore you, I have the right to ignore you if I want to. I'm not forced or compelled religiously to answer your phone call. But you know, people sometimes they lost these mannerisms of visitation. And I'll tell you, in certain countries, <laughs> when someone doesn't answer the door after three knocks or rings, what happens? You start to become creative. No, you don't go back. You start to become creative now. So then they start to find little stones and they start to throw them at your windows. Yeah, yeah, this is well known in certain countries like in Sudan where I'm from originally. You know, the person doesn't answer. First you knock like that. Maybe there's a power outage in, or electricity, you know, blackout or what have you. So you hit the doorbell, no one answers. You hit the knock on the door. They don't answer. Then you take a, a rock and you hit the door with the rock. It's much louder. And then they don't answer, then you can be creative. You can be hitting the doorbell, knocking on the door, calling them at, on their phone, and throwing stones at the same time. <laughs> because I'm trying, to, I need to get you out of there, you know? One of my friends, he said he was sleeping in his home, it's a hot country, the window is open. He's sleeping, taking a nap, fast asleep. He's sleeping like this, he says a rock smashes on his forehead. <laughs> yani imagine, <laughs> imagine you're napping and suddenly whap, 
A rock hits your forehead. He said, I got so mad, I didn't even want to know who the person was. He said, I just put my, my head out the window without opening my eyes. I said, whoever it is, you better leave or I'm going to come down and kill you. He says, two weeks later, this guy comes up to me. He's like, what's with you? The other day you were threatening us, yaakhi. Yaakhi, look at this guy. Allah concealed his identity and he exposes himself. <laughs> but, you know, people lost the, the rules of visitation and they just they become more aggressive uh, in, in trying to get you to answer and more creative. You know. And it also could be that someone might, might not like you. you know. Inshallah, this doesn't apply to any of you. But there was one guy in our area and he had a very, very dangerous tongue. This guy, he would always either speak about this man's wife or this man's mother, just always trying to expose people's faults. And he would call you and insult you first and then tell you about other people. So, who wants to talk to someone like this? Do you want to talk to anyone like that? So I used to ignore him. A whole year, I'm ignoring the guy, he doesn't get a clue. It's like, why don't you, what, what am I going to tell him? Yani? That's the best way I can tell him, is I don't want to talk to you, but I don't want to tell it to his face, you know. So... <laughs> But they keep pushing it. He would never answer my calls. Never in a whole year. What does that tell you, Habibi? A whole year, you didn't get the clue? Anyway, so we spoke now about the hours that you can call people, the number of times you can keep calling someone. Now I want to talk about the greeting. And the greeting very simply is, Assalamu Alaikum. It's very simple. First it's Assalamu Alaikum. And then whatever else you want to say, you can say it. You want to say, Hi, how are you? What's up? What's happening? Say whatever you want to say, but the first thing you say is Assalamu Alaikum. And we know very well from the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ was sitting in the masjid, a man entered, he said Assalamu Alaikum, the Prophet ﷺ said, 10, 10 rewards for saying Assalamu Alaikum. Another man entered, he said Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, the Prophet ﷺ said, 20. A third man entered, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh, the Prophet ﷺ said, 30. So we're looking at other 10 or 20 or 30 rewards from saying Assalamu Alaikum. How many do you get from saying hi? Or what's up? Zero. <laughs> the brother said negative 10. Huh? What's up should be negative 10. Huh? So, you get that reward. I mean, and how many phone calls do you get per day? Who gets over 10 calls a day? Yeah? Some people get over 10 calls a day. Some people get up to 25 phone calls a day. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum wa rahmatullah at the beginning of each of these phone calls. Then you have 10 or 20 times another 10 or 15 even, and then that's how much reward you get per day, and then t multiply that by 365 days a year, and multiply that by how many years you use your cell phone, you see that it adds up. A lot of reward, it comes up to thousands and hundreds of thousands. So the first thing is you say, Assalamu Alaikum, and then there's a guy called, I call him the mystery man. So the mystery man, basically, Assalamu Alaikum Alaikum Salaam, you know who this is. And you know generally when it's embarrassing for someone when they don't remember who you are. Because it's almost like telling you, you're so insignificant, I forgot who you are. It's, it's embarrassing. So, but some people don't, <laughs> they don't mind embarrassing you like that. So the guy calls you, Assalamu alaikum alaikum You know who this is? La wallahi, I apologize. You don't remember me? La wallahi, I don't remember you. You don't recognize my voice? He's like, wallahi, I don't. He says, think about it, think about it. <laughs> Then I said, Wallah, I can't remember you, He says, I met you in 2008. So, Wallah, I met a lot of people in 2008. It was the Journey of Faith conference. There were about 5,000 people at the conference, Wallah, I don't remember you. I'm the brother who had the beard and the hat. <laughs> oh, I know who you are now. But they keep just going on and on and on. So, this is not the proper way. The proper way is very simply, Assalamu alaikum. If the person doesn't know you or you got their number from someone else, this is the first time that you're in contact with them. So, Assalamu Alaikum, this is so and so. And then you can keep going on with, Hi, how are you? How is the family? How is everything like that? So, it's, يعني, if, if let's say Ali gives me Hassan's phone number, when I call Hassan, I don't keep him in suspense. Assalamu Alaikum, my name is Kamal, I'm calling you, I got your number from Ali. And this is concerning such and such. Oh, ahlan, ahlan, wa sahlan. How are you? How is the family? And then we get into our topic. But there's some people who do it the other way around, so you're in suspense the whole time. So you see the strange number, you answer, Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa salam, kif halak, alhamdulillah, Allah yajzik khair. Hayyak Allah, Allah yahayyik, Allah yahfudak. Kif al-ahal, alhamdulillah, Allah yajzik khair, ahlan, ahlan wa sahlan. Barakallahu feekum, barakallahu feekum. Taib ya who are you man, you're killing me. You know? So, <laughs> so the nice way to do it, uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is so-and-so. If they don't know who you are, don't recognize you. 
and then you go into the hi, how are you, how is it, and everything. And then you might ask a very nice and important question, is this a good time? Is this a good time? And it helps people, it, and it gives you a way out. So he might tell you, no, actually I'm just in the middle of dinner, just give me 10 minutes and I'll be free, inshallah. Or I'm actually driving, just give me a few minutes, in, or, or about to drive, yeah. So, uh, is this a good time? Is a good question to ask people, you know. And it's it, to your benefit, because when you ask someone, is this a good time, and they tell you no, if you don't ask them that question, they're, they're busy with something else, they're not going to give you their full attention, right? They're not going to give you their full attention because they're busy. So ask them if they're busy. And if they're busy and they let you know, you'd better call them at a time when they're free. They'll pay more attention to what you're saying. So, uh, we have, uh, what is the evidence then for what we're saying? Introduce yourself, let the person know who you are. We have a hadith by uh, Jabir radiallahu anhu. He says, I came to the Prophet sallallahu about a debt concerning my father. He says, أتيته, أتيته I came to the Prophet sallam, about a debt of my father's. فقال, he said, who is that? Who is it? Is he knocked? The Prophet said, who is it? He says, قلت أنا. I said, it's me. So the Prophet sallallahu he says then, قال, أنا, أنا. يعني, me, me. What does that mean? He says, قَالَ أَنَا أَنَا كَأَنَّهُ كَرِهَهَا He said, me, me, as if he disliked that. The Prophet ﷺ disliked that answer. Someone knocks on the door, he says, who is it? He said, it's me. What is that? How does that help me at all? I don't know who you are. Who is me? So the Prophet ﷺ disliked it, and he showed his dislike of saying just me. And so the best thing then, and the etiquette, is to introduce yourself and say, you know, my name, you did, my name is so-and-so, or I got your number from this place also. Because it makes people, uh, you know, relax and feel comfortable. And, um, you know, especially a lot of Muslims are paranoid, that I can speak for the United States, a lot of Muslims are very paranoid. If, if you know, you call them, yeah, my name is uh, Abu Bakr. They're like, okay. They're, now what do they think? FBI, uh, what do you call them here, CSIS? MI5, what happened? They get scared immediately. Oh, it must be, how did they get my number? So you tell them, I got your number from brother so-and-so because I want to talk to you about an issue. They feel comfortable. People are paranoid, so just make everyone uh, relaxed and comfortable. So uh, you introduce yourself after you give the salam, then you can go on to the asking about their, their situation and all that. Um, you know, sometimes you get these people who call you and then they ask you, who's this? Who gets annoyed from that? It's very annoying, huh? So someone who called me, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Who's this? Tabiyah, you called me. You don't know who you called generally? You just dialed random numbers? So, uh, what if then, what if someone, you're calling someone and someone else answers, their parents answer or someone like that? You also greet them. Assalamu alaikum, how are you? How's everything? I'm actually calling for so and so. Is he here or is she, is she there? My speak to. But don't just, you know, call, Assalamu alaikum, you know, is so and so here? You know, greet that person a little bit, especially if it's you know your friends, parents, or someone like that. How about picking up someone else's phone? You know, there, there's some. You know, if it's a friend and you have that relationship, yeah, and it's okay. Where you know you all have the same friends, and he's not married, and what have you, and and he tells you you can pick up my phone. It's not an issue, and you, you can pick it up. But generally, it's not it's not the rule. You know, don't pick up someone's phone, and and uh, sometimes your friend is over here, and his phone is over here. And the phone rings and he says, could you pass me the phone please? What do most people do? Huh? 95% of them do. This is how they pass the phone. <laughs> it's none of your business, ya It's not your phone. Who cares who's calling them? But most people, they just can't pass the phone without... Here you go. Most people do that. Don't do that. It's not your concern who is calling them. It's their phone. It's private. Yeah? Um... There was another guy that, uh, that every time, this is a true, true person in our area, every time you got off the phone, who was that? Who was it? What do you want, Yani? You know, by the way, this is not good manners. When, yani, one time this guy came to my house, every time I opened the drawer, he was sitting down, every time I opened the drawer, he did this. What are you trying? What are you looking for? What are you trying to do? I'm opening a drawer in my house, you're trying to peer into it? So some people are like that. They got to put their nose into things and know what's going on. Control it. Don't read people's, look into their phone, don't answer their calls, unless they allow you to do that. I want to talk a little bit about pranks and scaring people over the phone. We know very well that when you scare a believer, Allah will cause you to be scared on the day of judgment. I'm not going to tell you, you know, don't have fun with the phone and don't have fun with your friends, but don't scare 
the believers. It's not good. In the States, you know, some of the things we do, with people would call each other and, and pretend they're immigration, you know, Mr. So-and-so. Yeah, we need you to leave the country within 24 hours. The guy starts thinking about packing and getting his family already, and he's scared. I know some people, they pretend to be the police, and they really scare people. Like, we, we have video of you murdering this man. Like, I, 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 you know? So, it's not good to scare people like that. Other things that are, that are wrong that people do with the phone is that, for example, they'll, they'll record phone calls, especially about sensitive issues, you know. You, you're talking about something and they record it, they record, they record the conversation. And then they either, you know, jokingly, jokingly blackmail you with what they've recorded from you, or they, what they'll do next time a group of friends were in someone's house drinking tea, they, re, they play it. Without your permission, you don't even know this, and they're all laughing at the things that you're saying. This... Besides being very rude, it's also betraying the amanat and the trust of, of the majalis and of conversations. And you're not, in, in whatever happens between you and a brother is actually like a secret. You're not supposed to disclose it. You know, I know when we're children, in order to give a secret, you say, I'm telling you a secret, swear by Allah, I won't tell anyone, and then the person swears, then it's a secret. But when you grow up, anything that happens between you and an individual, it, it stays with you. There's no need for you to spread it around. Just like when the Prophet ﷺ whispered something into the ear of Fatima radiallahu anha. He did it in front of uh, his other wives. So then Aisha radiallahu anha asked her, what did the Prophet ﷺ tell you? So Fatima radiallahu anha, she tells her, well, he, he specifically, يعني, if he wanted you to know, he wouldn't have said it in my ear. True or false? Makes sense, right? If the Prophet ﷺ wanted everyone to know it, he would have said it out loud. He said it in your ear, that means it's a secret. So that's, that's how it is. Everything you see in your brother's home, it's a secret. Like if you go to your friend's house and you know, the mother yells at him a lot, you know? Or it's a, it's a dirty house. You don't have to disclose this to anyone. I went to brother so-and-so's house. Ya Allah, the way his mother yells at him, embarrassing. She insults him. No, it's a secret. You don't disclose any of that. So you don't record people's conversations without letting them know. And it's also illegal in most countries in the West. It's illegal. And that's why when you call companies, they tell you your call may be recorded. They let you know because it's illegal to record your voice without giving you uh, like uh, the warning in advance. We want to talk about the use of the speakerphone. A lot of times people will, without warning you, put you on speakerphone. And they're supposed to warn you, especially if there are people around them. So they tell you, when you call them, they tell you, I'm on speakerphone. Uh, because a lot of times people will put someone on speakerphone and ask them to do something silly. You know? So, Brother Abdul Fattah told you, I think I have a nice voice for uh, Nasheed, but I'm a little shy and so on. He said, no, you're good. So then you're on the phone, you've got your friends with you in the car, like, Ya yeah, give us some of that Nasheed uh, of, of Ummati, you know? And the brother's like, ah, singing. <laughs> and everybody else is giggling and laughing at him, because he's horrible. You should have asked his permission, you should let him know you're on speakerphone and there are people here, you know? And I know one, one brother, and he would always look to make his friends look bad in front of his wife. So he would always call them and say, Same, tell that joke or imitate Sheikh so-and-so. And then he'll put him on speakerphone in front of his wife. Always, always. I think maybe the guy's plan was to try to show his wife that he's better than his friends. So, she, so she'll feel like, you know, well, all his friends are idiots, but mashallah, I married a great guy, you know. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that was her plan. So... So, uh, you know, especially if you know someone won't approve of it, don't put them on speakerphone without permission. So whenever you put someone on speakerphone, let them know I'm putting you on speakerphone. And um, any, any of you get uh, headaches from using the phone? How many? No, it's very strange. I, I get severe headaches from the phone. Ear aches, jaw aches, nobody? Allah, mashallah, that's great. Okay, but a lot of people get, get headaches from using the, putting the phone close to their head, so they use speakerphones. Always let people know that they're on speakerphone. speakerphone. Some of the things, the pranks, the other problems is that people will, will call and sometimes will pretend to be women. I know I had a friend in, in one of the Muslim countries and he loves to pretend to be a woman. And he's quite, you know, his, his voice is good at it too. And he'll call and pretend to be a woman. And you know these things, the Prophet ﷺ said that the men who resemble women are cursed, women who resemble men are cursed. You want to stay away from things where you hear the word cursed. But this guy would call people up. He one time he told he tells me himself that he called his own father up, and he pretended to be a woman. Okay, and he said it got so far that I actually arranged a date with my own father. <laughs> he says, 
he says that, uh, you know, we agreed to meet at a certain place at a certain time. I said, did you tell him it's you at the end? He said, no, I couldn't. We, it went too far, you know. I couldn't tell him, hey, it's me, your son. It's like, he's a married man, he's got grown children, and now he's, he's ha setting up a date. But you see what happened, what the problem is here, is that this man, this poor man, could have had a normal day, had breakfast and gone to work with no sins. But now by doing this, you pulled him into getting a sin. You pulled him into arranging a date to meet with a strange woman who's not related to him in some street while he's a married man. You, you pull him into that sin that he otherwise wouldn't have fallen into if you didn't call him and prank him. I'll tell you another story. This, uh, and in the least case, it might cause embarrassments in real situations. There was a friend of mine he used to call also. This is in the States and he would pretend to be a sister. And he, he had a terrible sister voice. I mean, nobody would be convinced at all that it's a sister because he had a very horrible sister voice. And I would see his name and I know it's him and he pretends that he's a sister and everything. One day, I get a call from a sister, real sister, who sounds just like him. <laughs> and she wants to schedule a lecture. She wants me to come to their state and schedule a lecture. And I think it's him. And here I am, fooling around with the sister that I don't know. I'm like, oh yeah, sister? You want me to come and give a lecture, sister? Oh yeah? Where do you live, sister? <laughs> and, and she just you know, kept being very serious. Suddenly I realized that this is a real person, it's not my friend. Now, how do I even apologize to her? Wallah, you sound like a, bro a brother, friend of mine. You can't even apologize to someone like that. So, uh, the least case is that it puts people into yeah, in embarrassing situations. So just be careful. Generally what we're saying, be careful. And, uh, you know, we're not saying you can't have any fun at all with your friends. And, but just be careful what, you know, what this might pull people into. And uh, there are other things where people show off with their conversations, so they'll start dropping names or mentioning figures just to show people that, you know, I'm a businessman or I have, you know, this kind of money for the sake of showing off. And we said this is not how the believer behaves. The believer is humble and they have haya and they don't try to, to show off. And while showing off about your business transaction, someone might give you, that you don't know, might give you hasad and blow the whole transaction for you. So it's not wise to do something like that. Advice for students. Don't answer your cell phone in class. Don't do that. It's very disrespectful, you know. A lot of young kids sometimes they answer their phone in class, especially if it's like Islamic class. In school maybe they don't do that. But I remember I used to teach at this Islamic school over the weekend. And I used to never answer my phone in class. Out of respect for the topic and out of respect for the students. Even though they were like young teenagers and stuff. One time I'm getting this very important call, I really want to answer this call, but I see that the phone ring, and I don't answer it because I'm teaching Islamic studies. And out of respect for these people. I mean, also we have to show them that this is serious, because when they go to the regular school, their science teacher doesn't pick up the phone in class, because it's a serious school. Now I'm teaching the hadith, or I'm teaching Islamic studies, or aqidah, and I answer my phone, what does that tell the kids? So out of respect, I don't answer the phone. Ten minutes later, one of these kids gets a phone call and he immediately answers, starts talking and getting up and walking out and he does this to me while he's walking out. <laughs> MashaAllah. I wonder what, what emergency a 14 year old has to hear about in the middle of my class that he needs to walk out. I always imagine, what, what's the phone call go like? Huh? Mm -hmm. Okay, I see, I see. Is Pikachu okay? <laughs> Alright, let me know if anything else happens. <laughs> What did this kid need to know, Annie, that's so urgent? What are they going to talk about? Huh? I remember one time I, went, I, I taught at this class, uh, at this high school. After, cl after school, I would go and teach these kids who had aqidah class. And you know, they would answer their phones. I told them, what do, you, what do you kids answer your phones for? And it was disrespectful. So one of the girls, she said to me, she said, my phone is my life. I said, you need a new phone. <laughs> and I get a life, you know? Anyways, let's, uh, let's keep going here. Um, we want to talk about the ringtones. Can you use music as a ringtone? Why not? Because it's haram, it's not permissible. So don't use it as a ringtone. And the worst thing is that now people put music as a ringtone and it rings when they're in the masjid during salah. And so, so many times now in, in the salah we hear music and it's not like the, how it used to be before, these simple beats. Now, you know, just full-blown music now, and very loud in these phones. And there's some people who never turn off the phone, you know. It's okay, everyone forgets. If you forget to turn off your phone, it's something. There's some people who never turn off their phone in salah. 
and it just keeps ringing, and it's probably that guy who called you 34 times who's calling you, and it just doesn't stop ringing, you know? You know, in one of the Muslim countries, they, they were saying in one of the silent prayers, like Dhuhr or Asr, this phone kept going on and on, just playing music, it was blaring in the masjid. They said at the end of the salah, they found an old man in the front row, he was crying in real tears. And he said, Wallahi, I never heard music outside of the masjid. Now I have to listen to it in the masjid and in the middle of salah. So, don't put music as your ringtone. But why do some people not, why don't they turn off the phone? Because those people, they believe that making an unnecessary movement in salah is makruh. And that's true, right? Making an unnecessary movement in salah is makruh. But this is not an unnecessary movement. This is a very necessary movement. Because when you don't turn it off, it's distracting you. And it's distracting many other people as well. In some cases, everybody in the masjid is distracted. So this is actually now a very necessary movement and permissible for you to put your hand in your pocket or do whatever you need to do to turn off that phone. It's absolutely necessary. Because the whole idea is that you're not supposed to be distracted in your salah. We'll look some of the evidences of that. For example, this is a hadith that all of us know and love very much. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates, the Prophet said, if the iqama for Isha prayer is given and dinner is ready, what happens? Start with dinner. We all know this, it's our favorite hadith, right? So you, you start with dinner, why? Because if you don't and dinner is on the table, how is that salah going to be? It's all going to be, you aren't going to be focusing over there. That's Your focus will be on dinner. And you might be rushed or not very well focused because of dinner. And يعني, Allah forbid that you can smell dinner now. Allahu Akbar. Oh, we're having curry. Oh, I smell something. يعني, you just, no focus now. So, another uh, narration by Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an, he said, we used to pray with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa When it was intensely hot, when one of us could not bear to press his forehead on the ground in sujood because of the heat, he would spread his garment and prostrate on it. So whatever garment you have, a shawl or whatever, they would spread that and make sujood on top of the garment. Then they sit back, then in going down to sujood again, they put the garment. Every time they go down for sajda, they spread the garment. That's a lot of action, but it's a necessary action. Because if you don't make that, if you don't do that, it's going to be very difficult for you to make sujood. And I know maybe some of you in Canada, you're like, how hot can it be? Believe me, it can get very, very hot, you know. If it's like 50 degrees Celsius and the sun is hitting those like rocks or pebbles and you stand on them or make sujood on them, it's very, very hot. So this is a necessary action then. So you can turn off your phone. And this hadith was narrated by Bukhari and Muslim. So then uh, you can't use music as a ringtone. Just use whatever regular ring or ringtone that doesn't involve any music or musical instruments or, or like a rhythm or tone. A lot of times these, these tones get stuck in people's heads, you know. So just use something very simple. How about the Qur'an? Can you use the Qur'an as a ringtone? No. And this, is a, this was asked to the, the American Muslim Jurist Association, Amja. They were asked about this. And they said, no, it's not permissible to use the Qur'an as a ringtone. Because first and foremost, the Qur'an is a book of guidance, right? Allah Azawajal sent it to you as a book of guidance to give you a certain message. Allah didn't send down the Qur'an to tell you, hey, you have a call from Ali. Hey, you have a call from Hassan. That's not why Allah sent the Qur'an. So when you put the Qur'an as a ringtone, you bring it down to the level of being just a reminder that someone's calling you. You see? You see? Bring it down to that level. The second thing is that you might get a call in the bathroom. So while you're in the restroom, the, the Qur'an and the ayat of Allah Azza wa Jal are, are, praying, are playing now in the middle of the restroom. A third thing is that you also might answer the call because now it becomes just a ringtone to you. You don't listen to what the verse is saying. So you might cut off the ayah in the middle of a bad place. Yes? Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la taqrabu salah. You answer it. Not wa antum sukara. You don't answer the prayer. Or do not come near salah. You cut it off. Before it says, while you're intoxicated. So you can cut off the ayah also at a bad place. So that's the reason you don't use the Qur'an as a ringtone. Allah Azza wa Jal sent it as a book of guidance, not as a reminder that you have someone calling you. Also, you're not, you can't use derogatory sounds to indicate that someone is calling. True story, there's a guy, whenever anyone calls him, it's a regular ring. When his wife calls him, it's a dog bark. So, 
<laughs> so he's sitting and, oh, 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 it's the wife. He answers the phone. And there's another guy that he has a police siren. It's when the wife calls, he has a police siren. Another guy, there's a sound effect of a volcano erupting. Whenever his wife calls, volcano erupts, and, and the whole office knows, oh, it's the wife, and they all laugh at it. What do you think this poor woman would feel like if she discovered that the dog bark means she's calling? How do you think she would feel? And I can imagine that guy, one day he, he loses his phone in the house. Where did I put my phone? Where did I put my phone? She'll tell him, I'll call you. He'll say, no. Because <laughs> she'll hear the dog bark. She'll know that's what... Uh... So, all right, that's enough with that. Let's talk about the cell phone camera. And most phones now, they come with a camera. And there's this, there's this belief amongst Muslims and non-Muslims, that if I have a camera in my hand, I have the right to capture your image. Most people feel that way. Most people believe that. There's an event happening, I take pictures of people from a distance, and I can come in front of your face and take your picture because I'm the, fo I'm the cameraman. So it's like they don't need to ask your permission. Now we know one of the purposes of the Sharia ah is that it came to protect your reputation. Right? It came to protect your reputation and... Yani, uh, your image. So I have more rights to my image than you have to capture it. Now, this is something that's not really provided for by the law in the West, but this is something in Islam. So I can't just take a picture of you without asking your permission. I might get you in a bad position, or you're not dressed properly, or you have a bad hair day, and then this picture is on Facebook and it spreads and it's all over the place. People don't ask your permission, you know. So, um, and, and most people think that that's what they can do. I remember I went to one conference uh, in one of the states, and I would be standing speaking to a brother, and a sister would just come right in our face, put the phone, take a picture, and walk away. Another sister would come, and walk away. One time you're giving a Jum'ah khutbah, someone will get up, sister will get up, what do you think you're doing, Yaqi? It's a Jum'ah khutbah, what do you think? You just st stand up and take a picture, and... It's not, it's not a joke, yani. first of all, it's a Jum'ah khutbah, you don't do things like that. But who tells you that you have the right to just come and take my picture anytime or anywhere? So people, you need to ask someone's permission before taking their picture. Whether you have a digital camera or a cell phone camera, it's very important. As a general advice for sisters, that if, you, if you're at an event and there may be sisters who are not religious and people that you don't know, even if it's a women-only event, it's, it's good to these days to be extra careful and not remove your hijab if necessary, unless you really need to. Because, you know, these days people have weak iman and there's so many stories of women in these events pretend to be on the phone and they'll take pictures of, of women. Now, a woman will come, she wants her son to get married, he's looking to get married, she'll come and take photographs of all the girls and without their hijab and all that. And then she goes and gives the catalog to His Highness. And this guy is like... Hmm. Hmm. He gets his <laughs> he gets his free pick of the litter now. He's going through images of women, and they don't know that this. Yani, they're actually and and this, some of the problems, alhamdulillah, we don't have in the West, but in some Muslim countries, these are huge problems. Like people, they using Bluetooth technology, they'll stand next to you at a market or what have you, and steal your family's photos, and then they pass it around. There's one brother, he, one, one man, he came to complain, a young man, came to complain to the sheikh. He said, we used to you know, steal pictures of people's families, children, women, and, and daughters, and we'd pass it around to, to each other. He said, one day, they passed me a photograph of a girl, and it was my own sister. So it came back to him. And, and that's why, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, مَن تَتَبَّعَ عَوْرَةُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ تَتَبَّعَ اللَّهُ عَوْرَةَ وَفَضَحَهُ وَلَوْ فِي جَوْ فِي بَيْتِهِ That whoever seeks out the awrat here, it, the awrat literally means private parts, but here it means anything that's private or secret or, or the, from the affairs of the believers. Whoever seeks to expose that and seeks those things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will expose him even if he's in the middle of his home. So, uh, so these are some of the things also that I need to, to keep in mind and to ask people permission whenever uh, you're going to take their photo or something like that. Then there's the issue of spying. A lot of times you find spouses, they spy on each other. And uh, sometimes it leads to problems where they shouldn't have been a problem. True story, there was a sheikh, and he's telling the story himself. He said, I gave a lecture at the masjid. The lecture was entitled, My Mother. So it's a lecture about the mother, the excellence of the mother. So he said, we finished the lecture, we prayed the Isha, and went home. One of the musallin, he sent me a text message. He said, the sheikh, what do you think we do another lecture next week? And let's call it my brother, right? 
And so the Sheikh sent him an answer, a text saying, What do you think of my sister? And that man was married. Yeah? And his wife came to spy on him, to read his text, which, which really shouldn't be her business. She opened up his text messages and she saw the Sheikh telling him, What do you think of my sister? So she thought the Sheikh was saying, What do you think? You marry my sister, get a second wife? And she became irate and she started cursing and cursing the Sheikh. What kind of a Sheikh is this? He knows you're married and he tells you, What do you think of my sister? And then he has to explain to her, we, we have these, le- these are lecture titles. But if you weren't spying, we wouldn't be in this condition. And you wouldn't have cursed me and cursed the sheikh for no reason. So no spying. Um, there's some problems, like I said, we don't have here in the West. Like some phones um, in some countries, like they have these chat rooms that you enter through your phone. And people start to chat with one another. I visited one country. The Muslim population was totally taken by this thing. They were all chatting on the phones. The whole family, everyone's in a different corner chatting with other people. And <coughs> excuse me, the imam was telling me that a man came to him, a grown man came to him. He said, I was on these chat rooms on the phone. I was chatting to this lady for a while. And then we finally agreed to meet and he discovered it was his own daughter. That, it got that bad, yani. See, the thing is, most people, they think that, you know, I can chat over the phone with a woman if she's in Australia or in Houston or some other part of the world. Nothing, nothing's going to happen because she's far. We can't commit zina or, or touch or anything like that. But see, the problem is these, these things can be worse sometimes because when you don't see the person in front of your face, it lowers your inhibitions. And you'll find people more able to say things that they wouldn't say. A brother wouldn't say to a sister in front of his face. But she's, you know... Somewhere else, he'll say X-rated or R-rated things to her. And she'll think, oh, he doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know my family. He doesn't know my community. He can't embarrass me. So they go, to, they go very far and they go into the haram because of that. So we should actually be more careful, not less careful. Even, either, even through texting, through chat, through email. Because it can lead to a lot of haram. Um, <clears throat> we're actually at the end. I would just like to say that... Um, yeah, and for sisters especially, they should be a little bit careful about how um, they speak on the phone. They should try to keep their tone you know, somewhat straight, you know, not too up and down and soft. And especially brothers who are not married, these guys, they melt very quickly. Yeah? And there, was, uh, there was one brother who was saying that this woman called for a job interview. And he said from, from her voice, I knew that we were going to get married, he said. He said from the second phone call, I knew why I never was able to get married because Allah was saving me for this woman. And he just kept thinking about her voice and all that. When he went to interview her, she was 60 years old. <laughs> she just had a nice voice, you know. But the guy melted so quickly because, especially these brothers who are not married, you know, watch out for those guys. So a sister might be speaking to what she thinks is normal and, you know, if, uh, na'am. <clears throat> so, yeah, and whatever uh, they say that, that's normal, the brother is receiving it in a different way entirely on the other end. So be careful with that. So okay, in the end, uh, uh, alhamdulillah that they passed law that you don't use your cell phone while driving, right? And for those who live in countries where uh, you you can still drive and use your cell phone, don't do it. Because it it just really puts you at greater risk of of getting into a crash, you know? They tell you that using your phone while driving, it puts you at a risk. You're four times more likely to get into an accident. Imagine now after the lecture, I pull one of you aside, brother, put this in your pocket. And inshallah, on your way back home, you'll be four times as likely to get into an accident. You'll be very upset with that. Why would you give me something like that? But that's what the phone does to you and to those who are with you and your family, your children, puts you at that risk. Four times as likely to get into an accident. 25% of car accidents caused by cell phones. And you know, and, and a lot of people, like 19% of motorists, these numbers are from the States. They text while driving. And that means they spend 400% more time with their eyes off the road, you know. So then if it's not you, it's someone else that could be coming at you and putting you and your family at risk. But like I said, because alhamdulillah they passed this law, and by the way, the fact that they passed the law doesn't mean you check that there are no officers and then you just get on the phone. It just means you have to obey that law. Okay, uh, and and I want to close with a quick note on the dangers of cell phones. I want to ask you first, how many people feel that the cell phone itself is dangerous to you? Use of the cell phone is dangerous, it's not good. Put your hands up. Okay. And how many people feel that it might be dangerous? Okay. And how many think that it's not a dangerous device, it's just, just for making phone calls? Yeah? Okay. 
Um, I, I want to tell you, I, want to, I would like to, to encourage you to do your own research, but I would like to also to encourage you to move towards where you feel that it's actually not a very safe device. And I always tell people, the only one who cares about you is you. That's it. No one else cares about you. You know, big industry, they don't care about you. And I'll give you uh, something that happened four or five years ago. One of the leaders of, in the cell phone industry, in an interview, was asked, have you done any tests to see what kind of harm cell phones do to human beings? He said, no. They said, why not? He said, because in 10 years, we'll know exactly what, what they do to people. And they don't care. And if in 10 years, people's eyeballs start you know, falling, then we'll know that's what it does to people. They don't care. They just want to make money. And if you, don't, if you find that hard to believe, what popular industry doesn't care about your health? Cigarette, the tobacco industry, they don't care at all about your health. Actually, their product tells you this will kill you, and they still sell it to you. Because it's all about the money. In the States, it's all about whoever lobbies and pays enough money to keep the whatever poison. It can be an actual poison, or something actually harmful and known to be harmful, but they'll pay enough money and they'll, you know, they'll pass enough laws so that it's still available to people. So no one really cares about you except you. So in the end, because cell phones you see are relatively new, cell phones are new technology. And it's just in the 90s people started to have phones. It's not like older things like radio or television. It's new technology. So still there are not enough tests for us to be able to say 100% that this device is dangerous. But there are many tests to make you think that it could be actually very dangerous. A uh, university in Sweden, they, they found out that people who use a cell phone for a, a 10 years, for one decade, were twice as likely to develop a tumor in a nerve between the brain and the ear. The thing about the cell phone is that they use electromagnetic radiation in the microwave range. Because you know, you have X-ray range, gamma rays, it makes you to the Hulk. You've got the microwave range as well. And so what happens, some of the energy is transferred into your brain. And brain, the brain doesn't really have a, like a blood circulation flowing through it. So they tell you this energy transfers into the brain. Some studies show that it transfers, 400% more energy transfers into the, the brain or, or the head of a child because they have a thinner uh, cranium. Their skull is not that thick. So 400% more energy goes in. And up to a 16-year-old, about 200% more than an adult. So, uh, and then there are other studies that have linked a direct, have, have proved, يعني, established a direct link between cell phone usage and brain tumors. Others have even, and this was in Sweden also, uh, they established that even people who keep the phone on their hips, they develop testicular cancer. So, the, so I would encourage you to do your own research and, uh, and see and, and make up your own mind. But in the end, just try to be a bit more careful with it. Uh, they, they recommend sometimes some experts, and you can find a lot of interviews on the internet, on YouTube. The cell phone industry hired this guy to say that to do research and say that phones are safe. He's actually now one of the number one people in the world against cell phones because his research concluded they're not safe. Some people recommend, some experts recommend that you put your finger between your head and the phone. They say just that distance is good enough to decrease a lot of the energy. Some say you know use the speaker phone. Others say. Uh, use the you know the either the wireless one or the, even the wired one. They say still transfers energy, so you have to coil, put some coil around it to to spread out the, that energy. So, anyways, in the end, just do your own research. But I would like to move you away from thinking it's safe uh, technology. I'll I'll end by saying that the World Health Organization sometimes says there's no problem with phones, but at in another time they'll put out what is known as a precautionary principle, which basically means that we don't have enough scientific evidence to say it's dangerous, but we also have enough to assume there's potential risk or severe potential risk, and so they put out a precautionary principle. So take precaution for yourselves and for your families, inshallah. I'd like to end by asking you, um, what happens if you put uh, the whole mushaf into your phone, like written form? When you walk into the restroom, can you take the phone into the restroom if it has in it stored the whole mushaf? No? Yes, because it's stored in digital form. Once you close the screen, the writing is not on the screen anymore. It's stored in digital form, not like written on paper. So you can carry it into the restroom. How about the greetings that are always constant, always show up on the screen? What if it says the name of Allah? Can you take it into the restroom? No. So it's good to not do that, even though there's a discussion of what is exactly the restroom. But to be on the safe side, don't put Allah's name on the greeting where it's always on the screen because you walk into the restroom and other places. 
Uh, how about charging the phone in the masjid? Who thinks it's permissible? Put your hand up. Who says, you know, maybe not? Okay. Some of the scholars said, you know, get permission to be on the safe side. Get permission before you plug your phone in. Uh, others have said it's not a very big deal because, you know, for one, it doesn't draw that much energy. And sometimes the masjid will put a lot of outlets so if wh whoever wants to study with their laptop. So they assume that you might also have uh, usage from these plugs. But if you want to be on the safe side, you can ask. Uh, we know specifically in a hadith narrated by Muslim that you're not supposed to, in the khutbah, you don't play with pebbles, which is what at, at the masjid at the time, the pebbles, don't play with them. And even now, like the carpeting, you can't you know, rub images and draw things on the carpeting. They said, whoever does that, he has engaged in idle action. So if your phone rings in the middle of the khutbah, can you turn it off? Yes, because it's a necessary action. We know a specific hadith that you don't move when you're in sujood. What if your phone rings while you're in sujood and you're ma'mum, you're following an imam? Can you turn it off? Yes, because also... It's a, it's a needed action, it's going to distract you, it's going to distract others. So with that, uh, I'll end here, inshallah. I'd like to thank you for your attentive listening. So Allahum wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Zakum Allah khairan wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.